In this episode, we're taking a trip to my lovely Italy, as seen by Mendelssohn a couple of centuries ago, with an analysis of the first two movements of his Italian symphony. Hi, I'm Giovanni Grillo, I'm a conductor and a composer, and welcome to this episode of Conducting Pills, a series where we look into a classical piece or a part of it and outline its structure and phrasing, orchestration and harmony, with a bonus technical tips for conductors. I want to take a second to thank all of my patrons and to remind you that on my patrons page you can find the full episodes of Connecting Pills and the extra episodes tackling technical aspects on top of the live sessions and many other patrons' perks. And now, let's begin! The tour of Europe that Mendelssohn took between 1829 and 1832 was a very fruitful one. Landscapes of Nordic countries and islands inspired the Scottish Symphony in the Hebrides. And just the same, the vitality of Italy sparked Mendelssohn's imagination for the Italian symphony, his fourth symphony. The symphony is often referred to as a musical postcard from Italy. However, it's not until the last movement that we hear an authentic Italian musical folk tune. The other three movements are the fruit of Mendelssohn's musical imagination. They are a depiction of how Italy made him feel in all its various aspects, from the market to a religious procession, from a courtly dance to a peasant one. The first movement is full of energy and optimism. It's a scene from an Italian piazza, full of spirit, with people talking everywhere and, of course, being loud. The motor is provided by the chatter of the horns and woodwinds, minus the oboes, with sharp staccato repeated eight notes. The initial forte piano is accentuated by a single pizzicato of the strings. The first theme enters two bars later. These could very well be sellers in the market. And notice how the only strings playing are the violins in the octaves, preserving a certain lightness and freshness. We'll have to wait until bar 10 to hear the lower strings, where the head of the theme turns out to be a very important motivic element. This is quite a difficult piece for everyone involved, the staccato of the woodwinds to begin with. Everything is at a pace where you cannot afford to have any distracting movements. The bottom line is, keep it small and in the wrist. We're moving away now in some side street, the noise of the piazza getting farther away. The motivic element gets passed to the flute and oboes, while the chattering answer is provided by the strings. We turn to a corner and we get sucked into the cheerful noise of a piazza again, this time in fortissimo full orchestra timpani included. The elements begin to overlap. On bar 66, a cell from the theme is called out by the trumpets while the chatterings ping pong between the other sections of the orchestra. This game is repeated on 74 and following, with the cello and basses playing the full theme, the oboes taking the place of the trumpets, and the violins and violas doing all the chatter, while we get into a modulating bridge that will lead us directly into the second theme. Notice how the second theme, introduced by the clarinets and bassoons, is related to the first theme in the rhythmic element, while Violas and second violins smooth out the chattering by splitting up the accompaniment, which now has legato markings. The witness is passed onto the flutes and oboes to repeat the theme, and the entrance of the first violins on an A pedal, reinforced by a thin printed wall, opens the doors to a crescendo. Which lasts very little. It's a small wave that comes up and immediately retreats to piano and pianissimo. The motivic cell resonates in the clarinet in an ominous C-sharp minor on a dominant pedal of cellos and first violins. Perhaps we entered a shady alley in town, or the sun simply got clouded. But light is restored right away, concluding the exposition. The development begins with the chattering, naturally leading us towards the minor key. And then the surprise, a totally new theme appears in the second violins, emerging out of the noise of the first violins. This four bars new theme 
punctuated in the second half by small drops of the winds and in one instance the timpani, is treated in a fugato. And there's the first change. The violas only play half of the theme, the other half is played by the second violins while the harmony changes. The entrance of the cellos and basses is marked by the head of this theme only, at first marking the beginning of a section that in a standard fugue is called divertimenti, which literally means having fun. It's the section where bits and pieces of the theme and counter theme are reworked, split, passed between sections, generating a lot of excitement. And generating anticipation. The forte comes on 265 as a statement from the strings answered by the woodwinds who play the head of the first theme. The energy increases till we get to a fortissimo, unleashing all the power of that new development theme. The first theme pops up in the bass line on bar 313 and four bars later the two themes are joined together. The first half of the development theme attached to the first half of the first theme. The rhythmical element is the perfect excuse to gradually dissipate the energy building a bridge to the recapitulation. The recapitulation is shortened and the second theme arrives sooner, but the really interesting part begins on bar 456. If we follow the exposition, this would be the point corresponding with bar 159, where we enter the brief minor key moment to proceed to the conclusion. Mendelssohn does something completely different. He reintroduces the development theme in A minor. And he plays with it as if he was in the development section, with counterpoint and everything. Then we're back in A major and the two themes completely overlap. The development theme in the flutes and oboes and the first theme in the first and second violins. In this coda, both themes come into play, as does the chattering, while everything becomes more and more exciting in the più animato poco a poco, and the movement closes in the most lively way. Apparently, what inspired this movement was a religious procession. We are plunged into the darkness of the D minor key with an opening introduction of two bars played in unison by the entire orchestra minus the horns and cellos basses. Notice also the absence of the timpani throughout the whole movement. The introduction is extended of one bar by the cellos and basses playing counterpoint. And if you're looking for a reference to the walking bass in jazz music, he is certainly one. And the theme is finally introduced by the violas, the bassoons and one oboe, a very dark color. It could be darker though if the violas were an octave lower, for example, or with the clarinets in place of the oboe. But Mendelssohn's choice accentuates the sadness of this movement while avoiding too much weight and keeping a certain lightness. The second part of this phrase is introduced by violas, bassoons and oboe, and retaken by the violins with the flute counterpoint. In this first block, we have a clear structure. The first part of the musical period is presented and then repeated with a different orchestration. The second part, starting on bar 20, follows the same procedure. The bass line keeps moving underneath. The first musical paragraph ends and the musical idea derived from the opening bars is introduced. The orchestration is reduced to the strings only and the bass line counterpoint is passed to the second violins and violas. All of a sudden the sun peeps out in a gorgeous A major opening. It doesn't last long and the ominous introductory bars are back a fifth higher. Is it a repeat of the first section? 
well, only partially. It's shortened and has quite a few variations. It's more of a development part. After which, we get to the coda, starting with the second musical idea. Which continues with the introductory bars. And finishes by dismantling the first theme. The inevitability of the bass line is the only remaining element left alone to close the movement in a pianissimo pizzicato while the procession fades away in the distance. Thank you for watching, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking the subscribe button right below the video and ring the bell so you will get notified every time a new video comes out. If you want to support the show monetarily, you can do so on my Patreon page and if you're interested in conducting technique, follow my Facebook group. All the links are in the description. Let me know in the comments what you think about this piece and if you have any suggestions for future videos and I look forward to seeing you next week with a new episode of Conducting Pills when we'll go through the second part of Mendelssohn's Italian Symphony. In the meanwhile, please continue to enjoy music and be well. Ciao! It is a very sharp upbeat with no rebound. This will ensure also that the pizzicato of the strings will be together with everyone else. Right hand is enough.